飞山，撑，放松。It's an early Sunday morning in Veterans Park, Otisville, upstate New York. At a time of year when the trees are still green, but the mornings are starting to have a slight chill in the air, people of various ages, ethnicities and backgrounds slowly begin to fill up the otherwise empty park. They move quietly into a circle. With their eyes closed, perform graceful slow movements following meditation music from a loudspeaker placed in the middle. I think in the U.S. a lot of people think it's um, basically strictly a Chinese thing, but it involves meditation, probably. Some persecuted group, and maybe you have to wear a yellow t-shirt to do it. <laughs> For the last 20 years, you've heard journalists talking about them on the TV and radio. You've seen them holding rallies and peace protests around the world their practitioners of Falun Gong. In the 90s, Falun Gong grew rapidly and was celebrated throughout China. By 1999, 100 million Chinese practiced, but for the past 21 years, the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, has tried everything in its power to eliminate it. You know, the regime has spent billions and billions, year after year, trying to keep the lid on the Falun Gong issue. Only now, recently, with the pandemic, have people seen the mask come off. Media in the West have done little to expose these crimes against humanity. So Falun Gong practitioners inside and outside of China have mobilized to tell the world the truth. Who are these people? What motivates them? And how might their struggle to expose the CCP have far-reaching implications for all of us? One day when I was in the bookstore, in the Chinese history section, I came across the book Falun Gong, which had been kind of miscategorized and put in the wrong place. So when I, when I picked up the book and I started looking through it, I was like, wow, this is, this looks like what I'm looking for, actually. It's, it's that energy-related practice rather than martial arts. So I, uh, I took it home and that night I just read it cover to cover. It was, it was mind-blowing. It all started to come into focus that I had actually seen practitioners on my campus at college exercising and I was like, oh, that's what they're doing over there. <laughs> Uh, so then the next day I went out and met up with them and they taught me the exercises. Um, I was doing the, the third exercise where you bring your hands past your eyes and my eyes were closed but when I did this there's like a really bright light <laughs> every time my hands went past my eyes and I was like, I was shocked. I was <laughs> my heart started pounding really quick. I was like, this is real. Like the, the energy is actually real. I mean, I had done a lot of meditation in my life, but after this, I never felt lighter in my entire life. I, the experience is, it's almost hard to describe, but I felt like I was floating. And I remember walking away from the park back to, I was living in New York City at the time, back to the subway. And I just, the whole time, I just felt like my feet were barely touching the ground. I just was floating. And I said, I need you, I need to learn more. I want to know everything about this. In China, it was very mainstream. And this kind of practice has been part of their culture for a very long time. There's a, a physical element, like, kind of like you might find in yoga. And then there's a spiritual element. And this is an ancient um, kind of practice you would find in China and throughout Asia for thousands of years. It wasn't the specifics of what I was reading that drew me to it. It was, it was the perspective he was coming from that felt so complete and compassionate and strong and authoritative. You can only be that strong when you know something that well. And, and as I read, I was only being reaffirmed more and more why there was so much confidence behind the words I was reading. I had been spending a lot of money traveling to all these different courses and studying all these different things from iridology to acupuncture, other forms of Qigong, and I was spending a lot of money. And I thought for sure, tomorrow they were gonna start charging for this. So I started printing everything off that I, I could and took it home and read it. I remember when I first practiced, I went to the park and a practitioner told me how to do the exercise. After that, he didn't ask me about my name or my contact information. 
all the all the practitioner at the spot just smile at each other and they pick up their bag and they left and i was like because i was a little nervous i was how refreshing because it's not like everybody <laughs> try to get your content information ask you when you're gonna come next time the way i was in life before picking up the practice is that when i was very diplomatic and i don't mean that necessarily in a good way i'd walk into a room and i would kind of change my personality, what I was advocating for or not, depending on who's in the room. I don't want to ruffle any feathers, this kind of thing. And it, it always bothered me. One of the things I noticed in myself after studying the principles of Falun Gong is that change. I could walk into a room and be very comfortable first starting from a principle standpoint. What do I think is right here? What do I think is wrong? And even if everybody in the room is sort of against it or I look up to them and I don't want to, you know, perhaps offend them, I was much more natural. It wasn't something I had to force. It was very sort of natural to say, folks, here's where I think we stand. And that's, it sounds like a simple thing, but it's tremendously liberating. About six months after I started practicing, I went to Texas because uh, Jiang Zemin, the, the former leader of the Communist Party, went to Texas to meet with President Bush at the time. And so a lot of practitioners went there to, to basically protest and show banners uh, telling the leader to stop persecuting Falun Gong. So again, I was very new in the practice, but when I went there, it was like being in a sea of just incredibly nice, friendly people. They were there truly to peacefully demonstrate and call for help, really. And there was, you know, over the years, like, the term protest takes on different meanings, right? Many years ago, my husband and I had a few people come over to our house to work on an advocacy project. And these were all people who practiced Falun Dafa. So we were there to talk about what we were gonna do for the project. Well, after everyone went home, we found on our answering machine a recording of us speaking in our living room. Now you might think, oh, it was a hip dial. No, it wasn't. Because that same evening, other people who were at the meeting called us and they said, you'll never guess what happened. There's a recording of our meeting on my voicemail at home. So this happened to several people's landlines, actually, when they got home. Um, so we realized it was probably an intimidation attempt of some kind. So we reported it to the FBI. Um, the FBI gave us a meeting. So my husband and I went and met with them. And we talked about what happened. And they asked us one question. They said, do you guys have children? And we said, no. And they said, good, because you're up against a giant. So that uh, sentence has stayed with me for a long time. You know, they've been persecuted for 21 years in China and they're still peaceful. They're still trying to think of creative ways to stop the persecution without hurting people, you know? And it's just a remarkable group of people. Uh, everybody's nice. And everybody's nice when their self-interest isn't involved when they're dealing with you. But I think uh, what sets practitioners apart is that uh, practitioners require of themselves to be better people. And they require of themselves to consider others before themselves. And I think if you were to put somebody as nice, I think that's genuinely nice. And that's not nice when it's convenient for them to be nice and not nice when their interests are at stake. One time I was working with a practitioner uh, when I was in college and I thought this moment was very defining uh, in terms of being a practitioner. Uh, I woke up late in an activity that we were doing together, and I was supposed to deliver some audio equipment for the practitioner. And uh, when I woke up, I already saw I was maybe 30, 40 minutes past the time that we were supposed to meet. And I felt uh, really bad about it. And so I ran, it took me maybe 10 minutes to get to the location we were supposed to meet. And he was just patiently waiting there uh, didn't say a word, had a smile on his face, and I kept him waiting for so long. And it was because I was careless. <laughs> but he didn't say a single thing, I apologized, and he said, oh, it's nothing, don't worry. But I knew he had work that day, and he had to get back to his job. And I was just, um, uh, I thought that moment really encapsulated what being a practitioner is. Um, they didn't uh, bear any grudges, they weren't upset. 
very patient, and uh, he just said, "Don't worry about it. It's okay. Uh, um, it, what matters is now we're we're able to do this now. It's okay." From our perspective, the Falun Gong community, one of the principles we believe in is karma. Everything you do comes back to you. You do something horrible, something horrible is going to come back to you. You do something good, something good comes back to you. What? Think about what it takes to have a prison guard. He's a father. He's got kids. He's got a wife at home. And because of the propaganda, because the state is insisting that he persecute Falun Gong practitioners and force them to give up their belief, this otherwise perhaps decent man is now the implement of persecution, perhaps even a torturer. What does it do to that man's life? What does it do to his family, his community? That's very much in our minds. If you think about the persecution, it's really a mechanism for a whole lot of people to do horrible things, and that's all going to come back to all of us. And so it's not just about ourselves. It is about that, but it's not just about that. It's also everybody who's been caught up in this, helping them break free from this entire system that is a persecution system set out by the CCP. Free the Falun Gong practitioners so they're no longer victims. Free the persecutioners so they're no longer implements of that persecution. Everybody's being victimized by this in one way or another, and that's the real motivation. You know, there were 70 to 100 million people, Chinese people practicing Falun Gong. They had to justify this persecution. They had to get people to act the persecution out, to actually do the torturing, the arresting, and the turning in of practitioners. Because practitioners became good neighbors, good people, like it changed people, right? Good workers, good employees, all of that. And so they had to figure out how to make this persecution actually happen. And so they used their state-run media to defame the reputation of Falun Gong practitioners. And so they created a lot of propaganda against Falun Gong that people had to listen to through the radios, through the TVs, through everything, you know, on the subway, on, on the trains, day in and day out, day in and day out, so that they could justify arresting and taking in busloads, busloads of people every single day in major cities in front of everybody. The practitioners for years, they were trying to reach the media, but because the first thing that came out of China in 1999 was the propaganda, and it came out in force. Like, the regime is a skilled tactician in propaganda and controlling people's minds, essentially. So, as soon as the persecution started, they just unleashed this onslaught of propaganda, and the media just took that and published it as fact. They didn't do any research, they didn't ask any practitioners in the United States, and of course, the access that they'd be given in China would be very tailored and you know, carefully crafted. So they didn't have any truth. They repeated the propaganda, and that's kind of what stuck. So because they couldn't get a fair shake in the media, they had to go this grassroots method, handing out flyers, having parades, you know, having different events on their own. And then you know, in times where it's like people don't quite get it, They'll just look at the group from afar and be like, oh, there's a bunch of people wearing gold and yellow. What, what are they doing over there? Um, or like, you know, a lot of them are from China. They don't speak English, so they're, they're having these rallies in Chinese. So it's hard for people to connect and relate to those things. So a lot of times the first impression is kind of what sticks with you. I'm very lucky because I speak Chinese fluently. So I have been many opportunities to come across people from China at work and I always try to clarify the truth to them about Falun Dafa uh, because I found that almost always a lot of Chinese people had misunderstanding about Falun Gong. The fact that we're a bunch of grassroots people and we're up against uh, a communist foreign state using pretty much every tool in its apparatus to, to attack us meant that it's been very difficult uh, these 20 years to get people to be clear, first of all, on what Falun Gong is, and second of all, to be clear on what's happening to them in China, because obviously the Communist Party doesn't let people into China. They're not gonna let people sort of, there's no transparency into their prison system or their, their judicial system or the police. And so what they're doing is very, very veiled. And so it's been up to us, and it's also very heroically been up to the practitioners inside China who have been the ones who are literally going door to door 
in every single town, village, and city across China to explain to people what's really happening to Falun Gong. Practitioners continued commitment to nonviolence and to love their persecutors is incredible. I mean, what everyone has been through, the amount of torture people I know have been through. It's a tremendous risk inside China when, when Falun Gong practitioners go out and try and explain what's happening to them. But I think the, the, the point of view is that that's the most effective and really the only thing they can do. The Chinese Communist Party controls completely the media, the government, uh, the judicial system, the police. But if enough people come to realize what Falun Gong is really about and what the persecution is really about, at some point, they'd stop doing it. And that's exactly what's been happening. This is, I think, one of the real sort of small miracles that's inside China is that you're starting to see in the last several years, there are little villages or towns where the policeman in charge is like, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore. Because for the last decade, he's been having practitioners that are in his town come up and explain to him, hey, this is what Falun Gong is about. Hey, do you know what they're doing in the prison down the street? Do you know who's torturing this person? You know, this person lost her son, this person lost their whole family. At some point, that reaches the human heart. As we know, communism was kind of an import into China. It's you know, not part of Chinese culture, but unfortunately, that's the ruling party right now. Um, and they don't allow faith, you know, in many respects, but traditional Chinese culture involved a lot of faith elements. Um, so it's helpful, you know, not to view Chinese people or China negatively and to remember that it was once a very glorious uh, culture and civilization. And on some level, a lot of people still have that in them somewhere. Um, but because of the regime that they have been under, they've, they've been through a lot. You know, it's helpful to be compassionate toward them as well because they've been through a tremendous amount. Falun Gong is tremendously good for the world for a number of reasons. One is if everybody tries to become a better person, your community gets better, your society gets better. It's just, it has this huge domino effect of where everything improves together. I believe it's important for people to know the truth of Falun Dafa because the free world is at stake. I think if you look at what practitioners are going through as a microcosm of what the entire world is experiencing right now, then it's critically important for people to understand what practitioners went through in the persecution of the last 20-something years and what the whole world would face if they're not careful and if they don't learn from the experiences that practitioners went through in the last 20-something years.